In late August of 2020, Alan Kirshner and Chris White published a video entitled Seven Pre-Trib Problems and the Pre-Wrath Rapture. If you are a pre-tribulationist or have never heard of pre-wrath before, I would heartily recommend taking the time to watch it. Quite surprisingly, considering the contents of the video are so devastating to the pre-tribulational position, there has been very little, if any, response from the pre-tribulational rapture community. However, in November of 2020, Michael Nissim, a pre-tribulational rapture adherent from Nahariya in Israel, began producing a series of polemical videos as an attempt to respond to the points raised in the aforementioned video production and to try and refute the pre-wrath position in general. Nothing of what follows should be taken as a personal attack on Michael Nissim. Nothing in the contents of this video arises from any form of animosity, but I am trying to be as candid as I can concerning what I believe to be a serious mishandling of a number of scriptural texts. This is part of a series of videos responding to some issues raised by Michael's objections to the pre-wrath position. In this presentation, we respond to his video entitled Pre-wrath based on a misreading of 2 Thessalonians. Well, hello again everyone. This is Michael and Annie Nissim from Nahariya, Israel. Did you know that one of the most important passages for the pre-wrath model is based on a misreading of a text? Notice the pre-wrathers say that when it says, except the falling away come first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, he that opposeth and exalteth himself against all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, etc. What they're saying is that he will only be revealed when he sets himself up in the temple. Paul is giving an identifier of who this man of sin and son of perdition is. If he didn't continue on in verse 4 to describe who he is and what events are connected with him, believers would have been arguing until today about his identity. But verse 4 identifies him clearly. He is referring to the Antichrist already mentioned in the book of Daniel. This Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation in the midpoint of the 70th week. This is how we know who the man of sin, the son of perdition, is. So all that this text is saying is that the man of sin will be revealed before the day of the Lord comes. And the man of sin is identified as he that will sit in the temple of God. But the sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord. Verse 4 is merely giving a description of the man of sin, the son of perdition. However, the pre-Rothers would have you understand that the two are tightly connected, like it was written this way, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, when he opposeth and exalteth himself against all that is called God, and when he sitteth in the temple of God. But this is not what is written. To sum up Michael's assertions, 1. Because it is expected that we can identify the Antichrist before the midpoint of the 70th week, the idea, therefore, that the revealing of the man of lawlessness does not occur until the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel is ridiculous. 2. The phrase sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God is merely descriptive information and is not chronologically connected with the revealing in any way. 3. Antichrist's sitting in the temple does not need to precede the day of the Lord. Are these assertions of Michael Nissim's a killer blow to pre-wrath? Is pre-wrath doomed? <laughs> Let's find out. Let's investigate Michael Nissim's claims about pre-wrath. Is linking the revealing and sitting in the temple by Antichrist together and placing them before the day of the Lord a pre-wrath plot to pervert the text of 2 Thessalonians 2? This phrase, pre-wrathers would have you believe, 
rather suggests that something untoward is going on. So is the close linking of the apostasy, the revealing, and the self-deification of Antichrist in the temple some kind of willful and nefarious conspiracy by pre rothers Let's just quickly deal with this. John MacArthur, from his New Testament commentary on 1 and 2 Thessalonians, states the following. Paul's point is clear. The apostasy, Antichrist's blasphemous self-deification and desecration of the temple, is a unique, unmistakable event that precedes the day of the Lord. Since that clearly has not happened, the day of the Lord cannot have arrived. Though MacArthur wrongly equates the three and a half year period of previously unparalleled distress, aka the Great Tribulation, see Matthew twenty four twenty one, which scripture tells us begins at the midpoint of the seventieth week, with the day of the Lord, MacArthur, a staunch pre tribulationist, believes that the apostasy, the revelation of Antichrist and his sitting in the temple, are part and parcel of one and the same event and must precede the day of the Lord. A number of other, not necessarily pre Roth commentators, concur. John Nelson Darby wrote concerning the day of the Lord in his synopsis the following First, the day could not be already come. In order that the Lord should come in judgment, iniquity must have reached its height, and open opposition to God have been manifested. In the second place, the already known fact is asserted, that the apostasy must previously take place, and then the man of sin be revealed. Before that solemn hour, the day of the Lord, when God will judge the judges of the earth, this wicked one, despising all authority that comes from him, sets himself up as God, and that on the earth, where the judgment will be manifested. And then thirdly, in place of the Holy Ghost and his power manifested on the earth, we find the power of Satan, and with precisely the same tokens that bore witness to the person of Christ. End quote. Just for comparison, here's to post-tribulationist, Leon Morris, quote, The man of lawlessness even sets himself up in God's temple, claiming divine honours. Some understand this to mean the setting up of an image within the shrine, but the language rather indicates that the man will sit in the holy place in person. C.F. Jesus' words about the abomination that causes desolation, Mark 13.14. The masculine participle shows that a person is meant. An important feature of the rebellion, i.e. the apostasy, in the last days will be the attempt to dethrone God. The evil person will proclaim that he is God. C.F. Ezekiel 28 verse 2, Acts 12, 21 to 23. That's from Leon Morris's commentary on 1 and 2 Thessalonians, page 298. It should be clear then, just from these three alone, that the pre roth reading of the text is a view shared among mainline scholars across the board from pre to post trib and therefore not a pre roth conspiracy of some kind to alter second thessalonians in other words the claim that pre rothers would have you believe x y or z about second thessalonians 2 is not only specious but no objection specifically to pre roth at all other commentators. I read through a number of different commentaries on 2 Thessalonians, and they boiled down roughly as follows. Most commentators take the Greek word proton, meaning first, as modifying both the apostasy and the phrase the man of lawlessness is revealed, making them simultaneous, as the construction of the sentence in question lacks certain features which would be expected in order to definitively indicate that the apostasy must happen before the revealing. I imagine that this is part of the reasoning behind Alan Kirshner's statements on this issue in the Seven Pre-Trib Problems video. He is simply concurring with what the majority of serious Greek scholars and grammarians are already saying here. 
The following quotes are typical of this majority view. Quote, Although Proton, first in verse 3, could mark the beginning of a temporal sequence in which apostasy would be followed by the revealing of the person of rebellion, in the absence of K epita, meaning then, or a similar term with apocalypse, be revealed, it is more likely that the temporal adverb proton includes the whole of the protasis. This places the rebellion and the revelation of the person of rebellion on a similar footing. That's from Wanamaker's New International Greek Testament Commentary, page 42 and onwards. Beale, in his New Testament commentary, writes the following. Most agree that first probably applies to both events happening before Jesus' final coming. At the same time that there is a falling away from the faith, the Antichrist himself will make his appearance in history. It is more probable that his coming will instigate the apostasy. End quote. All commentators that dealt with this verse, though many pre-trib commentaries did not refer to it at all or passed over it with almost no comment, agreed that both the apostasy and the revealing are events which precede the day of the Lord. For example, Beale writes, A second reason the readers should not be misled in believing that Christ had already come is because the eschatological appearance of the Antichrist must also precede the Messiah's last advent. End quote. Harry Ironside Paul says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin is undoubtedly the same as the personal Antichrist of whom the Apostle John speaks in his epistles, and who is known also as the king who shall do according to his own will in Daniel's great prophecy. The day of the Lord cannot come until he has been made manifest. End quote. That's from Ironside's addresses on the first and second epistles of Thessalonians. Cyrus Schofield's 1917 Schofield Reference Bible, which is mainly responsible for the dissemination of pre-tribulational rapture theorism in the Western world, also places the apostasy and the manifestation of the man of lawlessness before the day of the Lord. It should be noted that earlier pre-tribulational writers, though they held to the notion that the rapture would occur before the tribulation, did not hold to the relatively recent theological innovation that the day of the Lord actually is the tribulation. That came much later when pre-tribulationalism was forced to change its very basis due to well-founded and devastating critiques from post-tribulationists like Alexander Rees. Commentators from both pre-trib and pre-roth picked up on the fact that the noun apostasia carries the definite article, and is referring to something definite and specific. John MacArthur comments thus, Paul was not referring here to apostasy, that is, defection from gospel truth, in the general sense. There have always been apostate churches, like that at Laodicea, Revelation 3, 14 to 22, as well as apostate individuals, Hebrews 10, 25 to 31, to Peter 2, 20 to 22. Such generalized apostasy, because it is always present, cannot signify a particular time period. Therefore, it cannot be the specific event that Paul has in mind. That's from John MacArthur's New Testament commentary on 1 and 2 Thessalonians. He further writes, Paul's use of the definite article reveals that he had in mind not a general flow or trend, but a specific identifiable act of apostasy. Here's some examples from other commentators. This is Kretzmann. The apostle assures his readers that the day of judgment would not come unless the apostasy had first come. That great rebellion against Christ and against the sum of the doctrines taught by him. He is speaking of a specific event in the future history of the world, of which he had spoken to the Thessalonians, of which he knew by prophetic insight and on the basis of the prophets, Daniel 8.23, 9.30, etc. A feature of this apostasy from the purity of Christian faith would be the revelation of the man of lawlessness. 
Brentner, a pre-tribulationist, writes, The definite article tells us that the Apostle has a definite event in mind, one that his readers would readily recognize. Daniel Wallace, in his Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, notes that the article points out an object that is well known. He further writes that sometimes it can refer to a well-known object that has not been mentioned in the preceding context, which is, of course, how we see it being used in 2 Thessalonians 2. So, from my survey of commentaries, I came away with the following. That linking the apostasy, the revealing, and the seating of Antichrist in the temple together as almost simultaneous or closely chronologically connected is seen in both pre-wrath and pre-trib camps, and is certainly not a willful distorting of the text just to support a pre-wrath position. Rather tellingly, none of the commentaries that I consulted placed Antichrist sitting in the temple during rather than before the day of the Lord. Most serious commentaries that got down to the nuts and bolts, so to speak, with the Greek text, believed on grammatical or syntactical grounds that the apostasy and the revealing are simultaneous events or intimately connected chronologically. There was general agreement that both the apostasy and the revealing occur before the day of the Lord. Both pre-tribs and pre-rothers note that the apostasy in question is not something vague and fuzzy, but a particular visible and discernible event that is singularly connected with the revealing, not the general trend of doctrinal downgrade which has always existed within the Church. The confusion between identifying the Antichrist and his revealing. If you've already been indoctrinated with pre-wrath and it's hard for you to read the text otherwise, then take a step back, read it later calmly, look at the text again and see whether the man of sin has to be revealed when he sets his image in the temple. Not only is this a misreading of the text, but it also doesn't make sense. Does it make sense that the Antichrist would only be revealed in the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week? I don't think so. Will believers have no clue who this world leader is until the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week? Yet this has caused a lot of confusion among pre rothers Michael Nissim's comments here actually highlight a common point of confusion among believers in general that needs to be cleared up. Namely, the conflation of the revealing of Antichrist in the temple with the identifying of Antichrist as a person. Does it make sense that the Antichrist would only be revealed in the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week? I don't think so. Will believers have no clue who this world leader is until the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week? As can be seen, this conflation and confusion is apparent in Michael Nassim's own remarks as well. So as with the previous point, Michael's objection is not really against pre wrath at all, but against an issue common to the different eschatological camps. And I can absolutely agree that this issue causes confusion and needs to be addressed. Can we then identify the Antichrist before the midpoint of the 70th week? Broadly speaking, I think this is quite probable. Firstly, from the biblical data available, there is sufficient evidence to state that the person who will become Antichrist may well be identifiable before the midpoint of the 70th week. For example, there is the pattern of wars from Daniel chapter 11, from verse 36 onwards, for instance, which could provide such a clue. There is his identity as one of ten leaders who displaces or disposes of another three. There is his death, or at least his receiving of a fatal wound, and then subsequent raising to life. His name and the number of his name will be connected with 666. However, there are a number of caveats we also need to be aware of. Jesus specifically tells us 
that there will be many false Christs and false prophets arising in that period, so it may not be immediately apparent who this individual is from the outset of his career. There could be considerable confusion surrounding this man of lawlessness. After all, the underlying power behind him is referred to as the mystery of lawlessness. The Antichrist will be one of ten other rulers, three of whom he will, though at some point, displace. So which one of the ten he could be may not be clear at first, and exactly when he displaces them is not disclosed to us. What Scripture does not tell us is how closely in time some of the events in Antichrist's career occur in relation to the abomination of desolation at the middle of the 70th week. They could happen immediately before the midpoint of the week rather than a long time before, or with some of the prophesied events even after that. There is considerable discussion among the believing community on this matter. Even his name that will be associated with the number 666 may be a title assumed by him after his rise to power or upon his revealing in the temple. While there is one factor that is constant and easily identifiable, namely the existence of a real physical temple or holy place in which sacrifices are being offered, and this must certainly come into being in order for the prophecies concerning the abomination of desolation to be fulfilled, it does not say specifically that the rebuilding of the temple is actually due to the strengthening of the covenant in Daniel 9.27, or that sacrifices are actually begun in the temple because of it. It's certainly a reasonable inference from the context, but it's not an absolutely certain one either. Daniel 9.27 is notoriously tricky to interpret, as there is a good deal of ambiguity and obscurity within the text. For example, is the Antichrist instituting a covenant or strengthening an existing covenant? The Hebrew would support both, but grammatically, the second actually is more likely. Is the covenant actually a peace accord? It nowhere specifies that in the surrounding context. Yet untold books and a kind of eschatological mythos have been built around the so-called seven-year peace accord. It's unwise to be dogmatic in some things. There are some portions of scripture, of which Daniel 9.27 is one, whose exact meaning will only become absolutely clear as the events surrounding it unfold. Scripture tells us that there are some things that are sealed until the time of the end when knowledge will increase. Daniel 12 verse 4. In all such cases we should be guided by the rule to not make hard and fast assertions based on ambiguous or obscure verses, but hold our thinking open to correction at any point. The clear and unambiguous passages must govern the unclear or obscure. The more detailed and fuller passages help us to properly interpret brief summaries, and the explicit statements must govern what is implicit or not directly stated. The Jews of Jesus' time had some widely received preconceptions about the Messiah and what he would do when he came, many of which appeared scriptural, but were actually based on misinterpretations or highly selective use of texts, ignoring those texts that did not fit the prevailing presuppositions, or even outright human traditions that had no basis in scripture at all. It did not go well for them. We would be wise to learn from their mistakes and not lock ourselves so tightly into any single interpretation of scriptures that are obscure or ambiguous so that we are blinded to other biblically credible possibilities. And let us also beware of the rabbinic kind of reasoning that makes void the word of God in order to preserve human traditions, teaching for doctrines the traditions of men. Nevertheless, as we have seen, 
there are items that provide evidence for a possible identification of the person who will become the man of lawlessness before the midpoint of the 70th week. So that's all well and good. But how does it square with the revealing at the midpoint? Now we look at why identifying the Antichrist and his revealing are not the same thing. Believers come to faith through the testimony of the Gospel, whether through hearing preaching or reading some portion of the Word in some form or another. We know from the Word of God that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, Son of God and Saviour, the Lord God incarnate. We have identified him as such and believed in him. Yet for us too, a wondrous revealing awaits. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us, For it is right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to you who are being afflicted, to give rest together with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. With flaming fire he will meet out punishment on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will undergo the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his strength when he comes to be glorified among his saints and admired on that day among all who have believed. And in Luke 17 verse 30 we read, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulphur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. At this parousia, it says that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and admired among his saints. It is on that day that the Lord Jesus' true nature as Almighty God, Lord of hosts, King of kings and Lord of lords, will be revealed for all to see, no longer veiled but openly displayed. His saints will wonder at and be amazed and astonished by the revelation of their Saviour's glory and power. Consider also the experience of the disciples. In Matthew 16 we are told that some at least had already identified Jesus as the Messiah. Yet they had not seen Jesus' true divine nature and glory unveiled as it were at that point. This happened a few days later when they had a transitory glimpse of it in a brief revealing on the Mount of Transfiguration. So, in like manner, merely identifying the person or knowing who will become the man of lawlessness is not the same thing as his essential nature being fully revealed. The two, therefore, do not have to take place at the same moment in time. Not only that, this revelation of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 is, like the apostasy, not something general, but something extremely specific and tied to a particular event, just as the revelation of Christ in Luke 17 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is something specific and tied to a particular event. But more on that in a moment. To sum up this point, the problem is not with the revealing of Antichrist being at the midpoint of the 70th week, but with our definition of what the revealing actually is. Once we understand that this very specific revealing, at least in this particular context, is not the same as merely identifying who the man of lawlessness is, then both the confusion and any objection to pre-wrath on this point disappear, and thus a major stumbling block to a natural reading of the passage is removed. If the revealing is not about identifying the Antichrist, what then is it? The Antichrist sits in the temple with a specific purpose. 
he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. End quote. Clearly, the satanically indwelt person of Antichrist sitting in the temple of God and proclaiming himself to be God cannot be anything other than the abomination of desolation. Such a desecration of the temple and such blasphemy and presumption cannot be anything else. And scripture, of course, tells us explicitly that this occurs at the midpoint of the 70th week. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul actually describes this revealing as a parousia, a grand arrival or manifestation of Antichrist in satanic glory accompanied by lying signs and wonders and devilish power to deceive on a huge and unprecedented scale. One commentator described it as an antiparousia, just as the word antichristos means instead of Christ. Even so, this is a counterfeit parousia to mimic the real parousia of Christ. It is important to observe the, the parallels between how Paul describes Christ's parousia and revealing in 2 Thessalonians with how he describes that of the Antichrist, as it brings into very sharp focus Jesus' warnings about being deceived by false parousias in Matthew 24. Just as Paul and Luke describe Jesus' parousia as a revealing when he appears in the glory of his Father, so too is the parousia of the Antichrist a revealing when he appears in the glory of Satan and sits in the temple at the midpoint of the 70th week proclaiming himself to be God. At that time, the kingdom of Satan on earth will come in unparalleled power as Satan testifies to Antichrist with miracles and signs that this man of lawlessness is his own son in whom he is well pleased and will do all his will. The unveiling of the empowering principle behind Antichrist will occur to such an extent that the satanic origin of his power will be openly acknowledged and approved of, as we see in Revelation 13 verse 4. The earth's inhabitants will openly worship Satan himself without a qualm. pre rothers and some pre-tribs like John MacArthur are of the same opinion that the revealing is when Antichrist sits in the temple and is openly displayed as the ultimate satanically energized opposer and blasphemer of the true God. The revealing and the sitting in the temple are part and parcel of the same event which we know as the abomination of desolation. I should add at this point that scripture appears to indicate in Revelation 13 that the creation of the image of the beast follows the Antichrist's self-deification in the temple, so that they are not exactly the same thing. The chronological gap is probably very small, but it is logical that the image would be created after the Antichrist demands the worship of mankind. So the Antichrist does not have the image made and then sit in the temple afterwards. Let's now look at the reasons why both pre-Roths, many pre-tribs and most commentators do not separate the revealing and apostasy from Antichrist's sitting in the temple. 1. Paul's purpose in writing. Paul wrote to comfort the eschatologically confused Thessalonians and correct their misconceptions with a decisive proof that the day of the Lord had not arrived. This demanded that the proof he offered should be clear, connected to something highly discernible and unambiguous. Given the dependence of Paul's eschatology on that of Jesus, and his close connecting of the day of the Lord with the parousia, it would be the most natural thing in the world for Paul, when encountering the same fears and upset warned of by the Lord in the Olivet Discourse, to use the non-occurrence of the exact same sign that Jesus said must occur before his parousia as proof that the day of the Lord had not arrived, and thus reassure the distressed Thessalonians. Next, did Paul place a full stop, a period, 
after the word revealed and then begin a new thought, merely so he can describe the Antichrist, so the Thessalonians can rightly associate him with the figure in Daniel? Is that all that he was doing? Would that have comforted their distress by giving them the chronological information that they needed? Or was he instead elaborating on the theme of apostasy and revealing, adding further detail and unfolding it before their eyes, so the Thessalonians could see beyond any reasonable doubt that the sign which preceded the parousia stroke day of the Lord had not occurred? In Greek, verses 3 and 4 comprise one single sentence. There is no full stop, no period after revealing, it's represented that way in some English translations in order to reduce the complexity of the sentence for English readers, but in Greek it is one continuous train of thought piling one concept on another. This single sentence of verse 3 to 4 contains two main parts. A clause expressing the conditional element, namely the if, except, or, unless part of the sentence the grammatical term for which is a protasis. The other clause which concludes the sentence and expresses what will happen if the conditions are fulfilled is termed an apodosis. In Greek, the words of the apodosis are missing, but its content is clearly and unmistakably implied from the context, and thus there are supplied in italics or brackets in every single English or foreign language Bible, almost without exception, wording such as that day shall not come or it shall not come, etc. Interestingly enough, one of the more detailed and comprehensive, not pre roth by the way, commentaries, Baker Exegetical, noted the following. Modern translations place the implied apodosis before the lengthy protasis, so that the sentence reads smoother and the contemporary reader does not lose track of the logical link between the two halves of this conditional clause. Paul, however, likely intended this implied apodosis to come at the end of the lengthy protasis. In other words, the commentary is suggesting that the sentence should read thus. Let no one in any way deceive you, for unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, the day of the Lord will not come. And of course, historically, this is how most Christians have, in effect, understood this text. 2. The Thessalonians' Knowledge We must also ask, did Paul feel the need to identify to the Thessalonians the man of lawlessness with the figure from the book of Daniel? It seems rather stretched, particularly since Paul remarks in the very next verse, Surely you recall that I used to tell you these things when I was still with you. The Greek elegon behind I used to tell you, suggests a repeated action. He also reminds them that they know accurately, idate, about what restrains the revealing of the man of lawlessness. So it seems rather unlikely that they have forgotten who the man of lawlessness actually is. Also, we should remember from the preceding verses that the Thessalonians' problem is not so much with the identity of the man of lawlessness than with their confusion about the order of events that must precede the day of the Lord. In other words, the overarching purpose of Paul's eschatological exhortation is not so the Thessalonians can identify the Antichrist, but so that they can properly understand the sign that must occur before the day of the Lord can begin and thus realise that the day of the Lord cannot possibly have arrived yet. 3. The information that Paul provides us with to describe the revealing, contextually 
Paul provides us with no other association or definition of the revealing apart from the self-deification of Antichrist in the temple, that which we also know as the abomination of desolation, and the information he adds to that between verses 5 to 12. There is no reference in all of that material to the wars of Antichrist, the number of his name, though of course Revelation had yet to be written, the covenant of Daniel 9.27, etc., only the abomination of desolation. Even a casual viewing reveals the huge dependence of Paul's eschatological teaching on that of the Olivet Discourse. Alan Kirshner noted at least 30 parallels. We find the same concepts and motifs and in the same chronological order as those described by Jesus. Sometimes it is clear that Paul is developing and expanding upon Jesus' themes but it is all too clear to the unbiased or unemotionally invested reader that they are speaking of the same thing. Hermeneutically speaking, we ignore this at our peril. It is no surprise, then, that Paul refers back to the abomination of desolation in the Olivet Discourse and the events surrounding it to provide his conclusive proof of the non-arrival of the Day of the Lord. We should not fail to appreciate the significance and magnitude of this event in the eschatological timetable of events. It occupies considerable parts of the book of Daniel, appears in three of the Gospels, and is a centerpiece in the book of Revelation. It is one of the signs that Jesus specifically says we are to look out for. It also marks the midpoint of the 70th week and the beginning of the time of unparalleled distress for the saints, also known as the Great Tribulation. It is also the first sign that Jesus gives us of the onset of his parousia. We are explicitly told to watch for it, so that we are not led into deception by false parousias, false Christs and pseudo-prophets. Small wonder then that Paul used it. Why would he need to refer to something else? Number 4 the timing of the revealing vis-à-vis -vis the removal of the restrainer. Is there any chronological clue to the timing of this revealing that will aid us in dispersing any confusion surrounding it? Well, Paul tells us a number of things that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work and trying to bring about the revelation of the lawless one, that an unspecified agent is currently operating to specifically restrain that revealing until God permits, that when the restrainer ceases to operate, then, and only then, will the man of lawlessness be revealed, that this revealing is also referred to by Paul as literally a parousia, the same term used for the coming of Jesus in glory, and the Antichrist parousia is accompanied with all manner of satanic power and deceiving signs and wonders which will allure to destruction those who have no love of the truth. We need then to look for a parallel passage in the scriptures that describes the point in time when Satan and the Antichrist are permitted to act without restraint, and where mighty satanic signs and wonders are in operation to deceive those who reject the gospel. We find this very thing in Revelation chapter 13. Note these things. After his ejection from heaven by Michael, the dragon falls to earth, and gives the beast his own power and great authority to rule. The beast is permitted to exercise authority to act and rule for 42 months. During those 42 months, he is permitted to blaspheme God and to make war on the saints. The second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast, so he cannot have this authority before the first beast has received his, so he too 
operates only by permission. The second beast is permitted to perform great and momentous signs on behalf of the first beast, and by those signs he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Those who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life are given over to deception, just as those who do not love the truth in 2 Thessalonians 2 are also given over to deception. Clearly, the point where the beast is given authority by the dragon and permitted to act must be the point where the restrainer is no longer thwarting the efforts of Satan to bring about the revealing. We know exactly when this point of permission is, at the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. At the same time it is clear that it is then, and only then, that the second beast is allowed to run his miracle crusade on behalf of the first beast. From this it becomes apparent that if this is the point where the restrainer is removed and the beast is permitted to act and receive the worship of the unsaved, then according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 6-8, the, the revealing of the man of lawlessness with all manner of devilish power and lying signs and wonders cannot have happened before this. And therefore the revealing of the man of lawlessness and his sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God are effectively one and the same event otherwise known as the abomination of desolation. Now let us look once again at what the Nisims are saying about the Antichrist sitting in the temple. The sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord. The sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord. As we have seen, even pre tribus like John MacArthur rightly connect the seating in the temple with the abomination of desolation, which they also rightly place at the midpoint of the 70th week. Michael Nassim himself admits that Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation in the midpoint of the 70th week. So this makes his claim that the sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord sound rather odd and self-contradictory. What is going on here then? Well, it appears what the Nisims are doing here is attempting to separate the concept of Antichrist sitting in the temple and declaring himself to be God, i.e. the abomination of desolation, from the apostasy and the revealing of Antichrist, which specifically have to occur before the day of the Lord. Why, though, do they make such a claim? Where does this concept come from? Once again, it is a question of definitions. Pre-tribulational theorists are forced into trajectories like this because of the modern pre-tribulational assumption that the whole of the 70th week of Daniel is the tribulation period, that the tribulation itself is the wrath of God, and that the day of the Lord and the tribulation are effectively synonymous. This idea, unstated in the Nisim's video, but assumed in their reasoning, though they advance no evidence for it, stands at the back of their assertion that the sitting in the temple of God does not need to precede the day of the Lord. Simply put, it is universally acknowledged among commentators that the event described in both the Gospels and Daniel 9.27, 11.31 and 12.11 as the abomination of desolation is here being referenced by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 and also by John in Revelation chapter 13. Though Paul does not use the exact term abomination of desolation but rather describes what it entails, he states specifically that it must occur before the day of the Lord can begin. Consequently, the entire 70th week of Daniel cannot be the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord cannot begin at the start of the 70th week either. Not only that, Paul clearly associates Jesus' returning in glory with his angels to grant rest to his persecuted saints, the parousia, 
the gathering unto him, a.k.a. the rapture, and the day of the Lord together in the same breath, so to speak, revealing that it is at his glorious return on the day of the Lord that the saints are gathered. This, of course, is ruinous to the aforementioned assumptions made by the pre-tribulational rapture theory that equate the whole of the 70th week, the tribulation, and the day of the Lord. They are thus left with only three choices. They can acknowledge that the tribulation and the day of the Lord cannot be the same thing, and therefore jettison this belief. Some pre-tribulationists have already done this, and retreated to the abandoned trenches of the early Darbyists, but then have become exposed once again to all the problems that dogged primitive pre-tribulationism on other issues back then, and which compelled them to abandon those positions in the first place. They are then forced to defend their theory using artificially constructed means, such as an overemphasized dispensational distinctions that preclude God's working with Israel and the Church at the same time. Which subject was also dealt with in the Seven Pre-Trib Problems movie? Or they can simply ignore the issue, never mention it at all, and hope that no one notices. This is the default position of most tribulationists. Or they can attempt not only to disassociate the reference to the parousia and the gathering in chapter 2 verse 1 from their referent context in chapter 1 and the subsequent reference to the day of the Lord in chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, but also in some way disassociate the apostasy and the revealing which Paul states must occur before the day of the Lord from the sitting in the temple and self-deification of Antichrist, which so clearly occurs at the midpoint of the 70th week. Those pre-tribulational theorists who choose option 3 have to expend considerable effort and ingenuity on attempts to neutralise this passage. The main trajectory this has taken has been to atomise the text, isolating the component parts of Paul's argumentation from each other and claiming that they are unrelated. Thus we have had attempts to not only decouple parousia and gathering from the description of the Lord's return in chapter 1 and the day of the Lord in chapter 2 verse 3, but some have also tried to disassociate the parousia from the gathering as well. Thus we have had the concocting of the apostasia equals a physical departure and therefore it could be the rapture doctrine of Thomas Ice. A greater hermeneutical monstrosity would be hard to find, and even though Ice has publicly admitted that he has no linguistic basis for it, he continues to promulgate it to this day. Thus also we have the conflation of the revealing with merely identifying the Antichrist, which while it can be an issue of confusion on both sides, has been providing a rather convenient pretext for decoupling it from the abomination of desolation. And thus also we have the assertion that the sitting in the temple and the self-deification of Antichrist, namely the abomination of desolation, can occur during and not before the day of the Lord, which is in effect to deny that Antichrist sitting in the temple and declaring himself to be God in verse 4 has any connection whatsoever to the revealing and the apostasy that Paul has just mentioned in the previous verse. The revealing and the apostasy can then be claimed to be separate events which occur before the 70th week, so the pre-tribulationists can then continue asserting that the day of the Lord and the tribulation are synonymous. The Nisim's perspective on Second Thessalonians was new to my ears. I and others have literally never heard of such a thing before in pre-trib circles until they asserted it in their video. It sounds rather like a recent innovation, though I cannot say for certain. It may well, however, have originated with Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who claims in an article as recent as 2018 that Paul is actually teaching two revealings in 2 Thessalonians, one before the 70th week and one in the midpoint of it. 
thus separating what he refers to as the first revelation of Antichrist and the apostasy in verse 3 from the sitting in the temple and self-deification of Antichrist in verse 4 and the subsequent reference to the Antichrist being revealed in verse 8. This interpretation appears to be a fairly recent development, but whatever the case may be, it involves a radical rejigging of the text. I would challenge readers to find any clear indicator that Paul was switching from talking about one revealing to another one in 2 Thessalonians 2. This would not be the first time Fruchtenbaum has made such radical claims about a passage based on nebulous or non-existent evidence. He, in similar fashion and with equal lack of contextual support, effectively advocates two parousias in Matthew 24, based on the flawed peri they argument referred to in the Seven Pre-Trib Problems video. Fruchtenbaum has also recently become a subscriber to the apostasy equals rapture theory of Thomas Ice a proposition for which scanter evidence would be hard to find. Some final points concerning Michael Nissim's video. Did Paul forget what he was writing about? In addition to conflating the revealing with merely identifying the Antichrist and claiming that Antichrist sitting in the temple and declaring himself to be God does not need to precede the day of the Lord, the Nisims are also attempting to disassociate the day of the Lord in verse 3 from the parousia and gathering in verse 1 and its preceding context in chapter 1. Because Paul states in verse 1 that he's going to speak about the rapture and the coming of the Lord, pre rothers have argued that Paul is saying that the rapture will not occur until the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. But please uh, do notice that the text actually says that the day of the Lord will not come. That's at the end of verse 2. He says, don't be worried that the day of the Lord has already occurred, because the day of the Lord will not happen except the falling away come first and the man of sin be revealed. This point of Michael's was actually answered very well in the Seven Pre-Trip Problems video, as the following clip reveals. This could be called the Forgetful Paul view, because in their commentaries and sermons they will correctly teach that in verse 1 the words coming and gathering are in fact references to the rapture. This is not a debate among pre-trib or pre-rathers. Pre-tribs and pre-rathers agree that this reference, the gathering to be with him in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, is the rapture. But they will go through the rest of their commentaries talking about these two precursors to the day of the Lord as if they are only precursors to the day of the Lord, as if they have nothing to do with the rapture. It's as if Paul forgot to talk about the rapture, even though he said that was specifically what he was going to talk about in this section. He says, now regarding the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, let me just stop there. Well, Paul hasn't made any connections here. He's just saying, now I'm going to talk about this. Now, isn't it sort of odd if he says, now I'm going to talk about the rapture and the parousia, and then he doesn't mention it ever again? Well, he actually does. He's, um, he's unpacking what it means, the day of the Lord. Prewrath solves this problem by understanding that these two events will occur before the rapture and before the day of the Lord, and that Paul is using both concepts interchangeably here, as he often does in the New Testament. Prewrath also understands the revealing of the Antichrist in verse 3 is a reference to the abomination of desolation at the midpoint of the seven-year period. They also see the falling away or rebellion in verse 3 as a reference to the falling away that Jesus mentions in association with the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. In fact, this clear and consistent connection between Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians 2 is a really important point. A fundamental problem of the way that pre-tribulational interpreters interpret the Apostle Paul 
is they don't recognize that Paul is getting his teaching from Jesus. For example, just look at the similarities. In Matthew 24, before the rapture in verse 31, what does Jesus say must come first? You guessed it, a falling away and the abomination of desolation. And it's only after those events occur that you can expect to see the sign of the impending day of the Lord in verse 29 and the rapture in verses 30 and 31, just before it begins. Jesus' teaching on the end times is a perfect mirror to Paul's in terms of the timing of events, which is probably why Paul said that he got this doctrine about the rapture, quote, from the Lord. How do we know that the Apostle Paul received his teachings from the Olive Discourse, from Jesus' Olive Discourse? Well, we know this. We know this because there are thir at least 30 parallels between Paul's teaching in First and Second Thessalonians and between the Olive Discourse. There's 30 cohesive links between their teachings. It's not just pre-Rathers that see the connection between First and Second Thessalonians and Matthew 24. Just check the margins of your favorite Bible. Ever since cross-references have been invented, they have been linking these two passages. It's only the pre-tribulationists who can't accept that these passages are parallel to one another. To sum up then, we have briefly touched on the following topics. We have clearly seen that both pre-wrath advocates and pre-tribulational theorists associate the revealing with the sitting in the temple and the self-deification of the man of lawlessness, and that this interpretation is not some recent invention or a pre-wrath machination to pervert the scriptures. We've also seen the considerable confusion caused by conflating the identifying of the person of Antichrist with his revealing as described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the consequent misdefinition of that revealing, and have hopefully provided a basis for differentiating between the two in order to remove the interpretive difficulties this has caused. We have also looked at Paul's purpose in writing, and also looked at the timing information of the revealing vis-à-vis -vis the removal of the restrainer, and other parallels between Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians, which indicate that the revealing must take place at the midpoint of the 70th week. We have also observed that the Nicenes provided no biblical evidence whatsoever for their assertion that Antichrist's sitting in the temple, i.e. the abomination of desolation, does not need to take place before the day of the Lord. We have also noticed an attempt to divorce the day of the Lord in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 from the parousia and gathering in verse 1 that violates the context set in the preceding chapter which Paul is referring back to, where it clearly states that the Thessalonians will receive rest along with all the saints on the selfsame day that the Lord Jesus appears with his mighty angels, rendering judgment to the ungodly, which is as plain a description of the day of the Lord as you can get. This only leaves us then with a final question. Who is really misreading Second Thessalonians here? Can we really call what the Nicenes are asserting any kind of natural or contextual understanding of the passage? It appears to me that as is common with so much pre-tribulational argumentation, instead of following the train of the biblical author's argument, assertions are being made about the passage based on unproven assumptions and presuppositions which are eisegetically injected into the text and component parts of the passage are also being radically disconnected from the overall context. Can we say that this is actually a healthy or responsible way to handle scripture? Have the Nicenes succeeded then in defending pre-tribulationalism in 2 Thessalonians and presenting it as a rational and biblically based credible alternative to pre-wrath? Or have they instead merely exposed what extremities need to be resorted to and what severe contradictions need to be embraced in order to maintain pre-tribulationism in the minds of its adherents. Is there anything in their video 
that would cause an informed pre-Roth audience to reconsider their eschatological position? I leave the answers to these questions to you, the viewer. If anyone has been confused by the assertions in the Nisim's video, or perhaps you are a pre-trib believer who has begun to see the problems with that model, as a first step, I would simply advise that you step back, lay aside your presuppositions, read the text in question calmly, following the natural flow of Paul's thought through from chapter 1, seeing how he unfolds his subject matter to his readers, how he includes the Thessalonians in the eschatological events he describes in chapter 1, and how he answers their question. I would then advise you to look at the list of parallels between Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse and Paul's teaching to the Thessalonians. Look also at how Paul and the other apostles use the terms parousia, day of the Lord, day of Christ, day of God, etc. interchangeably, and see how that day relates to believers in the New Testament. Well, that's wrapped up this subject for the time being. So it's farewell for now, and may the Lord bless you in the reading and study of his word. Thank you.